Prabhupada, at that time, he wanted, he wanted to go. He wanted to go out. He was always, <laughs> when he was sitting, he talked about traveling, just like in 1977. As soon as he felt a little better, he said, I have to visit all the different temples. He was going to go to London, which he went to London. He was going to continue to the U.S. We know at that time, he said, 50% of my work is not finished. And he wanted to begin to set up to visit the farm communities. To this day, we're here in Vrindavan. <laughs> I was talking with a god sister saying, we need, to, we need to grow our own food. We need to have our own rice. We need to have our own dal. So we're still trying to figure out how to do this. 45 years later, 50 years later, what Srila Prabhupada wanted us to do. But just as he wanted to do that, he wanted to spend time with that, the most important thing for him was spreading this movement <coughs> all around the world. Mm. I was saying in his memory. So the first thing, when we came here in 1972, Kartik, I went there last week with some devotees to Radha Damodar Temple. It's the one place <laughs> since I've been here for two months I have never left this temple, <laughs> Krishna Balaram Mandir. One day I left, I went to Radha Damodar Temple, and there I spoke with some, some devotees about Srila Prabhupada's, what I saw of his life at Radha Damodar Temple. So everything is still the same. You can go see that place. Well, Prabhupada's rooms are the same, and much is being done in the courtyard again. But Prabhupada's rooms are just like they were very simple. Everywhere Prabhupada went, his rooms were very simple. This room here is one of the more opulent rooms that was built later on. But even in Mayapur, just small rooms with a, a bed off to one side, sitting place, very simple sitting place. So at Radha Damodar Temple you had the, his sitting room and, and his bedroom and on the other side of that open veranda was the kitchen. So I was being with Prabhupada, and he, he knew me, <laughs> I was very easy to read, I imagine, although I thought I was very tricky and secretive. But I had always been upset when I became his servant, because I had lost my Brahmin thread that he gave me. Um, within a month after receiving it in New Dwarka, May of 1972, I went back to New Vrindavan, and one cold morning outside bathing at that time, we were very austere at that time. We bathed outside from a creek, and New Vrindavan got quite cold. So one morning in the dark bathing, I went to chant my morning Gayatri, Mongol Arctic time when I was offering to the deities, and my thread was gone. And I cried. I thought, that's it. Prabhupada doesn't want me as his Brahmin disciple. My thread had disappeared. I think I washed it off in the creek <laughs> early in the morning. So I went to Kirtanananda and I said, Maharaj, my Brahmin thread, it's gone. How can I do my service? I'm no longer a Brahmin. Because the thread was gone. My <laughs> I was, everything was gone. And of course, he, he was very smart and he immediately said, oh, see by your sincerity, he said. He said, you just go on, do your service, we'll make another Brahmin thread. But I never liked that Brahmin thread <laughs> because it wasn't from Prabhupada's hands. It hadn't been transferred one month to the next. It was gone. So now I was his servant. Imagine, Prabhupada's servant. And every, every month I learned, one thing I learned when I believe it was the full moon, we would change Prabhupada's Brahmin thread. And it was a simple process. I would just put the new one on his desk and Prabhupada would take it, he'd have them both on, he'd put it on and sit very straight and he would chant Gayatri Mantra. I saw it dozens of times and I, then he would put the other thread on the table and I would take that thread for two years, I used to give it to Sankirtan devotees, temple presidents, this person, that. Every month I would get the thread and I would give it to someone, Prabhupada's. Maha Prashadam, Maha Maha Prashadam. 
So this time was one of the first times. So Prabhupada was sitting in his room, Radha Damodar, and he was chanting Gayatri, and I watched him, I saw him put the two threads together. So my plan was very simple. I'll take Prabhupada's Brahmin thread. Then I'll be connected again. Finally, after all this time, I'll have that connection thread Prabhupada chanted on. I was too embarrassed to say to him, Prabhupada, explain what happened. And he would have probably said, that doesn't matter. Maybe he would have chanted on one and given it to me. But I didn't do that because I was sneaky. Uh, <laughs> but I watched him from the veranda. I watched him put on his tea lock. Every day these things would go on. So Prabhupada was so regulated. Say one of the things I love so much being with Prabhupada is he was regulated. <laughs> he didn't do just fanciful things. One morning go out, six in the morning. Next morning go out, well, sleep in. I'll go out for my morning walk at 7.30. No, <laughs> every day the same, the same, the same. Everywhere in the world it was the same. The sun was coming up, he was on his morning walk. You could depend on Prabhupada like that. Like we all depend on Srila Prabhupada every moment. I do. Every moment of my life, I'm depending on him to keep me safe. So he was dependable. And I watched him chant. And I thought, as soon as he walks out of the room, he goes by me. And he'll go into this, where he takes prasadam in the kitchen, Radha Damodar Temple. So sure enough, he finished Gayatri. He got up. <coughs> You have to bend down, that low is like four foot high door. You didn't have to. <laughs> I did. I once hit my head. It's that thick the wall was at Radha Damodar Temple. So even you walk, you bent down to go in, there was still that much more wall you had to avoid. And the one time I did and bang my head on that wall so hard. And Prabhupada looked at me, he said, he said, that's to keep you humble. <laughs> Everything has a purpose. Prabhupada thought everything that happened, you could somehow turn it into a Krishna conscious activity. So just bending down to go into a room, he said, to help you be humble. So then Prabhupada walked out of the room. And as he always did, as he walked by me, I offered obeisances. And he stopped right in front of me. Instead of just walking directly into the kitchen, he stopped. And I saw his feet in front of me, but I had, so I got up and he looked right at me. He said, that Brahmin thread? I said, yes, bro. He said, you can bury it under the Tulsi plant. <laughs> yes, Prabhupada. <laughs> I had my plan. I had it all day long. I had this plan. And now he was burying my plan. <laughs> and I thought, now. No, I can't. I, I have to have this Brahmin thread. So he went into the kitchen. I waited till the door closed behind him. And I ran into the room. And I grabbed the Brahmin thread. And I went back on the veranda. I sat down and I was ready to put it on. And he broke every string. <laughs> every one. He never did it. 25 times I grabbed Brahmin thread. He never ever did it again. But he did it because he knew what my plan was. I didn't tell him my plan, but he knew, because he knew. <laughs> and me being the person that I was, I was still determined to use it. So I sat there, <laughs> and I got all the different strings that he cut or broke, and I tied them back together again, <laughs> like that was going to do. And I put it on very happily, and I chanted on his thread and my thread, broken or not, it wasn't broken to me. And that's what I did. So, and I kept it. So, I actually, it was one, inst well, many instructions, but it was one personal instruction he gave me that I didn't bury that under the Brahmin thread. So, that was October 1972, during Kartik. So, I'm saying Prabhupada has these running jokes. So, now, three years go by, two and a half years. Now it's like March, it's Gaur Purnima time, 1975. And we're in Mayapur for a big, big festival. 
And every day Prabhupada's giving initiation, 10 devotees, 12 devotees, first initiation, second initiation, and I'm his to servant. So one of my, my jobs, one of the job description was, which was very wonderful, you, you would all keep those beads, all the japa beads around your neck. You know, you might have 10, 12 japa beads around your neck. You felt very empowered and a bit prideful as well because you got to do that, you know, and stand by Prabhupada. And then after the fire jagya, the Brahmin initiates, they would come up to the room and you had the threads, you know, and you would hand them their Brahmin thread and send them in the Prabhupada's room. So this one devotee, he came up to me and I, I hadn't been very conscious because there was a way that you, you didn't just hand them a thread all wrapped up. If you know when you buy the threads in Loi Bazaar here, they're all wrapped in a special way and folded and wrapped and twirled. And you have to pay attention when you take them apart, otherwise you can knot them all up. So I just handed him this thread instead of opening it up for him and giving it to him in a proper way. I just handed it to him because I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. So we went into Prabhupada's room and as soon as he got the thread he opened the door and he tried to take it apart but he didn't know how to do it. So he got it twisted and knotted. And the secretary was in the room at the time, he was coming out the door and he said, uh, so this devotee looked at him, he said, Prabhu, he said, C can you fix this? Because he got very nervous. Prabhupada was right there waiting. He said, can you fix this? And Prabhupada's behind his desk and he said, give it to Shruta Kirti. He can fix it. <laughs> <laughs> because I was, he knew I was very expert fixing Brahmin thread problems. So, he, so that was three years later that he did that. But I actually didn't hear that from the devotee. He just came out and said, can you fix this? And I found the two end pieces and I grabbed them and and like that it was fixed. But I never was aware of what Prabhupada had said until 2005, 30 years later, when the devotee told me that story about how Prabhupada had had said that, give it to Shruta Kirti, because he was very expert <laughs> with Brahmin threads. So I had this, this thing with Srila Prabhupada, where he always knew what I was doing. Imagine this, the situation. He always knew in a good way. Like he said on a walk in Mayapur, yeah. everyone's walking and devotees, it, it became a morning. Mayapur was a very peculiar place. Um, in some ways, it was in Mayapur, Prabhupada always stressed the importance of um, not talking gossip. I never heard him say it anywhere else, but I heard him say it three different occasions in Mayapur where he told people not to gossip. Mm. So anyway, uh, this was a morning walk, and on the morning walk, the devotees were talking and they were complaining of this devotee's doing this and this devotee's doing this and to Prabhupada on the walk and he could hear them talking amongst themselves. Also Mayapur seemed like voices carried. <laughs> I think that's a song, voices carried. Anyway, voices carried in Mayapur and you could hear things being said. So Prabhupada's listening and he stopped and he just said, everyone is discouraging he said, you're all discouraging others. He said, my business is encouraging everyone. He said, you're discouraging. He said, but my business is encouraging everyone. And that I can, I can say as well that I saw over and over again. Whatever happened, <coughs> Srila Prabhupada always encouraged us. How it, whatever form it came in, if it was necessary to chastise, he would chastise. But the point was to encourage you, to help you along. Never discourage. My own experience so many times with Prabhupada was whatever nonsense I did, he would, he would just bring you back. He would bring you back in and he would encourage you. He never made you feel bad never made you feel like a fool. 
And we say you could do that. I could do that on my own. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Prabhupada didn't, he didn't emphasize it. He didn't stir that up so that you felt more foolish. No, he would do the opposite. He would always uplift you. I was thinking of um, when we were in Hawaii. Hawaii was, Hawaii was where I settled down after being Prabhupada's servant for uh, over two years. And I wound up staying there for s almost ten years. But um, when we were there, remember at that time there was Siddhaswarup. He used to be Sai. And he had many disciples, a hundred disciples. We just saw he, he offered them all the Prabhupada finally in 1972, 1973. He surrendered to Prabhupada and he had all his disciples surrender to Prabhupada. But they looked at him as their leader. He was their guru. And he was. So there was always a little <coughs> sometimes difficulty with the ISKCON devotees in general, especially from the West Coast, Los Angeles. There was a, a strictness uh, that we had and there was a you know, that unflinching devotion to Srila Prabhupada that some devotees didn't feel was there with the people that, that he had brought to Srila Prabhupada. That they weren't fully surrendered to Prabhupada, they were still surrendered to Siddha, to Sai, Siddha Swarup. And um, they would bring these, <coughs> these questions to Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada had a very special way of of saying things, if he had some criticism. Prabhupada didn't say, he didn't say, you do or you don't do. He always said, they say, or some say, someone has said. So he never, he never said, he never accused on his own. But he would always say, someone has said, so he said, someone has said that your disciples those, they are more attached to you, they're not surrendered. And, and he, of course he would say no. And he said, <laughs> they say, <laughs> they, he said, some say you don't carry a danda, because he was a sannyasi. And he said, well yes, Prabhupada, he said, um, he said it's very difficult traveling, six foot tall, you know, group of bamboo rods. He said it's, it's very difficult to travel on the plane with the Dunda. And Prabhupada looked, looked at him and he looked at his secretary, Paramahamsa, who had six and a half foot tall Dunda. He said, he is carrying. And then that was that. And then he said, and they say, you don't shave your head. And he, di he didn't shave his head. He was a sannyasi in our movement, sannyasi. And he, he said, well, yes, Prabhupada. He said, I don't shave. He said, but I, if I shave my head, I get a cold. And Prabhupada said, you live in Hawaii and you get a cold? <laughs> so whatever, but he didn't chastise him. He would just point things out. You know, like he didn't, he didn't make him feel discouraged at all. He just pointed things out. And it's, and it's how he always did with me as well. He would just s say things, not even directly, criticism, but he would just say it in a very special way that you didn't feel like you were being punished or trapped, you know. So then he said like that. And then, then I spoke up, which was very, very rare. And I said, well, Srila Prabhupada, I said, just like this morning in class, and there was Prabhupada didn't give morning class, he gave an evening class at that time. So in this morning class, Siddhasrup Maharaj gave the Bhagavatam class. And I said, when he entered the room, I said, one of the devotees, they put a garland on him. I said, but on the Vyasasan, I said, you didn't have a garland. So I said, I thought that the garland should have been given to you. And Prabhupada looked at him. He said, Shruta Kirti has a good point. 
And then he said, then Siddha said, well, I, I'm not, haven't trained them properly. He says, I haven't trained them. And then Prabhupada said, well, if you're not training him, he said, then what is the use of your preaching? So then it got very heavy. It went from one, from one spot, but he was making a point. He said, your business is to train. And we see this. I, I still, to this day, I see like that when I, I see Srila Prabhupada there. If I see others there, my god brothers or whatever it is. I think, first of all, we have to give all respects to Srila Prabhupada. Who has brought us all to this place? This very special place from everywhere in the world. We're here because of Srila Prabhupada. So whether he's your, your grandfather guru, your guru, whatever he is, he's, he's the path. I always say this road, Bhaktivedanta Swami Marg. He's your entrance, not just to Vrindavan. He's, he's your entrance into Goloka Vrindavan, not just this Vrindavan. This is what we all want. This is what we aspire for. This should be what we're aspiring for. And not to set up a very comfortable situation here. This temple, that temple. It's very easy now. We didn't have, there was no such thing as comfort in ISKCON back in the 70s. If you lived in a temple, it was austere. India, no question how austere it was. But even in the West, New Vrindavan was very austere in the winter time. Hmm? New York, I remember traveling with Prabhupada. We stayed two days during the winter time. It was so cold in that temple. They had, just like here, they had on the rooftop, they had the big water tower, the tanks. So there, of course, it freezes. Uh, it goes below freezing, you know, for several months in the winter. So these tanks have things that rotate to keep the water from freezing. So it doesn't get stagnate and freeze into ice. So that was the water that was coming out of the taps that we bathed in every morning. For a few days I was with Prabhupada, I remember using those showers and there would be hundreds of devotees, brahmacharis at that time, 28, 20 years old, 18, 19, 21, and there would just be a line <laughs> of these brahmacharis waiting for their turn to use the shower. And there was no hot water because they pulled, the, the temple president, he had, they would pull the taps off of the hot water thing. So you didn't have any hot water. And if you were lucky on the cold water one, there would be like a uh, vice grip or something, because that thing, everything was broken. The windows were broken in the windows, into the bathroom. So it was freezing cold. Not like here cold. It was very, very cold. And there would be this line, and as all you would hear as they went into the bathroom was screaming, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. And they lasted one mantra. You would go in, you would shower, and you would come out. So this was our life. But we didn't care. We didn't care for that because then you were going to go to Mongol Artik, you were going to chant, you had service, you could go on Harinam Sankirtan, and it was all blissful. And it was blissful because we were sacrificing so much. Mm. It's even difficult to have any austerity here in Vrindavan now. Everything is very nice. Although <laughs> illness still comes. <laughs> so we get, we get our opportunity to have some, some difficulty here, huh? some austerity. But the society has changed so much. Without that desire to do something for Prabhupada, to help spread his mission, what austerity is there? And we live very comfortable lives. But when we joined, we didn't have comfortable, materially comfortable, we left materially comfortable lives because we wanted to become Krishna conscious. And it was all from that one person that inspired all of us. Every step, every day, from the moment I joined, I heard Prabhupada's stories every day. What, whatever little stories there were, you would hear about it. Prabhupada's traveling, what he did in this place, what he did in that place. He kept us alive, always. And from the moment I became a servant, I saw how vital it was that everyone had that closeness to Srila Prabhupada. I would, as soon as I left Prabhupada's room, there would be dev devotees at the, at the door at Prabhupada's entrance. In New York, there would be a group of brahmacharis there. 
Sometimes the ladies would be there. As soon as I walked out the door, what did Prabhupada say? They, they didn't care. They just wanted whatever it was, they wanted to know what he said. And come here to Vrindavan, it was the same. They were outside the door. What did Prabhupada say? What did Prabhupada do? And I would just say whatever simple thing he might have said or done. And they would be so happy to hear what our spiritual master had done. Because they were the simple things, the amazing things he was doing every day. That was beyond our scope. Couldn't even imagine what he was accomplishing. Hmm. Even he was amazed 1975 when he traveled around the world he went to like 14 temples in two months and everywhere he went 10 years after starting the movement he saw hundreds of devotees chanting Hare Krishna and he was in ecstasy seeing it the mercy of Lord Chaitanya he would say he's so merciful and Prabhupada brought us all of that mercy more merciful than Lord Nityananda, Srila Prabhupada. So kind to us. Whatever we were, whatever we did, whatever nonsense we were doing, he accepted our service. Didn't matter how fallen you may be. In 1976, when he went back to New York, now they had the big, big temple, 55th Street. 55th Street, yes the skyscraper and there was a Govindas in the basement or in the ground floor of that place so there was one devotee he was a sannyasi and he had fallen down fallen down very 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 hard he was breaking all regulative principles which was very unusual someone took the meat eating that was that very unusual but he was but he still liked prashadam he had an attachment so he would go to the temple just to take prasadam. So one day he went there and devotees were out in front, out in f on the uh, sidewalk, and chanting. So he came and, and he saw my god sister, she was my wife before she died some years ago, Amekala. She was working in the kitchen and he said to her, what's everyone doing here? And she said, oh, Prabhupada's coming. And he said, oh, he said, well, I just came to eat. And this is uh, how fallen he had become. So she was very nervous that he was there because he was offensive. Mm. He had accused Prabhupada, he said, and I've heard this from others over the years. I gave my best life, best years of my life to Srila Prabhupada. I could have been, he said, I could have been a big musician he was a musician, he said, but he could have been a, a rock star. But I gave all my whole 20s to Srila Prabhupada. Oh, in this way he would say things that hurt the ears of devotees, you know. But she was very kind to him, very compassionate. She would sit and listen to him, go off about things. But now she was worried, here's Prabhupada's coming any minute, and here's this devotee in his beard, long hair, sannyasi. So as all this is going on, he shows up. Prabhupada's coming in the car from the airport. And so all the devotees jumping up and down, everyone hits the ground, the sidewalk offers dandavats, obeisances. He stands there and Prabhupada gets out of the car. And as soon as he gets out of the car, he walked right towards him. He had been his servant for a short time. Prabhupada taught him how to cook. And Prabhupada walked right towards them. And the Prabhupada had sannyasi on each side, and they both, Prabhupada, you know, they tried to direct him away, but Prabhupada walked to him. And he just looked at him. He said, so you'll cook for me while I'm here? And the, one of the sannyasis, Prabhupada, he, he eats meat. He said, and he's very offensive. So right away they just, discouraged anything from happening. They just discouraged it. And Prabhupada, not even hearing what they're saying, again he looked at him, he said, so you'll cook for me while I'm here? And he said, yes, Prabhupada. <laughs> so that's our Srila Prabhupada. This is our example. 
This is what we should c become like. Doesn't mean Prabhupada's great and we all remain fools and rascals. We should also become great in our own capacity. Not that we remain nonsense people, discouraging one another huh? as we progress in Krishna consciousness. So not only he got to cook for Prabhupada and the devotee, Amekala, who was always nice to him, she got to assist because it was his only friend at the temple was this lady. Huh? So now she's cooking for Prabhupada again. What could be more wonderful than the opportunity to do such personal service for Srila Prabhupada? So it's almost six o'clock. Uh, anyone have any questions or comments? Yes, Prabhu. Oh, uh, if I have heard correctly, I heard somewhere that Prabhupada said, can <laughs> you all become like me? Uh, did you ever hear that? And just uh, one more statement along with that. Since you've seen Prabhupada so closely, mm. how do you s recommend that we develop the Vaishnava qualities? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it's, uh, I feel like I'm distant from them, although I know them, but it's not really manifest. How to develop the Vaishnava? <laughs> um, uh, association. I always think association is the most important thing. And we choose who we associate with. Huh? It's our choice. You know, once a devotee asked Prabhupada, as he was leaving, I mentioned this that last class, as he was going off in the car and I'm holding the door to close it, and the devotees, how do I become Krishna conscious? And Prabhupada just looked at him and he said one word, desire. So it's all desire. Everything comes from desire. That's all we do. We're always desiring. And it, it, that's all that the spirit soul does. We're dependent on Krishna to fulfill our desires, but it all comes from desire. So if we're really in earnest, Prabhupada said determination is difficult. He said Krishna consciousness is easy, <coughs> determination is difficult. So we have to keep on going back to that same spot. And one way of course is to, to offer service to those persons. <laughs> You're not so inclined to serve, uh, take a humble position. All these things are, you know, I said last time, they even when they introduce me in temples all over the place, especially America, they'll say he was Prabhupada's secretary, he was Prabhupada's PA, his personal assistant. And I always, I don't, and I'll say, no, I was a servant. Uh, but no one wants to be a servant. So we have to develop that attitude of, of serving others. It's what Prabhupada did, he always encouraged. You have to know how to encourage others. <laughs> there was Nanda Kumar, he was Prabhupada's servant before me. He, he had a very um, uh, critical nature, he would see, and he would even say to Prabhupada, think this one's doing like this, and this one's doing like that. And he would also say to them, you shouldn't do like this, you shouldn't do like that. And he said, Prabhupada's response was, the rules and regulations are for you, for you to follow, not for you to make others follow. Huh? To others, we set an example, and we're very lenient, but they're for you to take personally. This is, this is our business. So the, the more we just act, I see, and Prabhupada did say, especially the leaders, he said, do as I'm doing. He, that's what he wanted them. He wanted them to do just like he was doing. And that, that didn't just mean chanting 16 rounds, following the principles. It meant everything we do. Huh? All through the day, 24 hours, how to deal with everyone in every situation, to become expert and to do what's best for others. Because if you do that, then automatically you'll, you'll get reap the rewards. Uh, you'll become that person just by doing, doing good for others. This all Prabhupada set out to do. He had a very wonderful life, he said, living in Radha Damodar. But he traveled around the world so many times showing others how to live. So you say, personally, yes, I saw how Prabhupada dealt with myself and how he dealt with everyone. And no one ever left discouraged. 
after speaking with him, you were never discouraged. You always encouraged to increase, in, increase your determination to be Krishna conscious. Mm. So that's what we have to do. If you do that for others, then you'll, you'll benefit. But we seek that association of, of people that will help us do that, people that are like that. Then, mm. of course, following everything, we have to follow the program Prabhupada set out. Yes. Yes. He's still, yes, he, um, b very big citizen group. Um, I don't know what they call him. He had the whole Hari Bull Society. They're all over the world. I Devotees are very. About, I think he's asking about the for sure. Oh, him. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, it didn't last very long. At least at that time. Um, yes. I can't say I, I really don't know, but no, he didn't come back. But he, he got to serve Prabhupada while he was there and cook for him. Even though he was eating meat, Prabhupada wasn't bothered. He, he wanted, again, encourage him. Because th th the only thing you can do when someone has fallen is give them service. Uh, it's why we come. How we come in the... It's our attraction from the beginning is to do some service. Then that can... I've experienced this myself and over the years, uh, sometimes, if especially in Grahasta life, you can, uh, I always say, it, it, it's another path. It takes you, takes you so many places, you know. So at times you can become very dried, and dried up. But as soon as you just dip into that ocean of service, you feel happy. You feel connected because we are connected. Yeah. Yes. So you, you said that we're always desiring different things. Different yes. Things. Um, you also said that we need to serve people um, the best thing that's for them. So if everyone's always desiring <laughs> these different things, how do we know what's best for Well, that's, that's why the spiritual master is there. That's, that's why we accept the spiritual master. Once someone asked Prabhupada, Lord Chaitanya, he doesn't say anything about taking initiation. And Prabhupada quoted Shashastakam, Trinadapi Suni Chena, to become humble, humbler than the blade of grass. Humbler. The blade of grass, when you tread on it, it pops back up. So Prabhupada said that. To become humbler means <laughs> you stay down. Mm, that's, that's humility. But, um, the desire, as I said, we, we desire, we're always desiring. Prabhupada's point was, we have to make Krishna, everything related to Krishna. That's all. We just relate everything. Whatever we're doing, we do for Krishna. You know, whatever we see, we see Krishna. I've told so many examples, Prabhupada said, how you can see Krishna everywhere. It's, it's, and the, the spiritual master, of course, he said, read my books. You learn how to do. But the desire was, if we have the proper desire, we associate with the right people, with those that can help us, those that inspire us to advance in Krishna consciousness. So I had a, a son, my son, he used to hang around as a teenager, as many teenagers did. He had a lot of bad association. And it was my wife, she said, she always thought that, you know, he hung around the wrong people. But then one day she said, he is the bad association. <laughs> she realized it wasn't, you know, people were associating with him. He was in that frame of mind. So we have to be, have the right consciousness. We have to desire Krishna. It's that simple. It's a simple process. It's just replacing you know, instead of thinking from what I want, what I need, it's how can I please Krishna? That's all. It takes, it's, you know, pr it's a process, yeah. Prabhupada said it can happen in an instant, but then it has to continue to happen. But it's a process that over time, things, things get easier. 
there was this whole discussion going on in the Prabhupada Disciple Conference. Somebody talked about sex life, you know, the dealings and how in ISKCON we've, you know, turned it into back in the early days. We were very fanatic people in so many ways. So there was a lot, so many difficulties because of that. Anyway, I finally put on, I said, age takes care of it automatically. <laughs> you know, if you think you're struggling with it as a youth, which that's going to happen. You know, when you hit your 60s, when you get to 70, y your body just, you, you can't eat very much. You can't sleep very long. Sex life is out of the question. You're just happy to get out of bed and get through the shower and get to a, you know, y y you know, so, so it's a process. You just stick with it, Prabhupada always said, just stay with the process and the result will be there. But so many things happen, right, just by nature. Yeah. I think Prabhu here. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. How it is wonderful. There are so many devotees of Prabhupada, so many. And you are fortunate that you got opportunity to touch his transcendental body. And yes. And so when I hear about these things and this one, I feel so much opportunity you people had to take the association with Prabhupada. And how this opportunity we can get to serve the property site? <laughs> um, I don't know. How do you get that opportunity? Just it's they're all around. They're around. If you want to serve Prabhupada's disciples, and of course, even sh I just had someone ask to give me massage. <laughs> we were in where was it? We were in Faradabad the other day, and I was talking about how happy Prabhupada was when you would come into the room with a japati all puffed up like a ball. You know, and you slid it onto the plate. So I was describing it, bringing him in, putting him on his plate, offering a base, and his running back out, bringing in another. And they had to puff up. There was no question of bringing one in. It was flat. It was still, and you would run in. So anyway, I was telling that. So then after, it was the, they had Sunday morning feast. So it was, it was over 9.30, 10 o'clock, and then they had their feast. So we were in the room taking prasadam, and there were some chapatis there, and dal, rice, like that. And the devotee said, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. So we waited a minute, we waited a couple minutes, and I said, can I have a japati? No, no, wait a minute, wait. So then they brought in like this many japatis, puffed up. They brought in puffed up japatis because they wanted to have that experience of doing that service. It was for Srila Prabhupada, but it was through me that they... They just wanted to do that so much. So it's that eagerness to serve that actually makes us happy. Yeah. So we have, to, we have to find it. It's very nice to serve the other Vaishnavas. Um, the more we do, again, the more you, know, you seek, out, seek out nice devotees, you render service to them and we become happy. I mean, I, I, I know we, we cooked as as busy as we've been here since we got here, after Kartik was over, we finally got the opportunity. We had we had some people over for prasadam, <laughs> Guru Prashad Swami and another Swami want to bring over. But just to give them prasadam makes us happy to serve the devotees. She's very happy to cook. You're cooking for yourself, you don't feel so much. But as soon as you get to do it for someone else, you become happy. So that's. That just shows you this is the process. You know, do things for others, huh? for the devotees, to serve the devotees, and we become happy. Yes? How Srila Prabhupada chooses his personal servants? How? How? Like you and then you rejected another one, is any particular system or just he can explain? Um, how they changed or why they, how did they choose, did they choose? oh. Did he choose them or did he reject some of them or how? No, he never, he didn't choose them. It was just, um, just time, place and circumstance. When, like when he came to New Vrindavan, his servant remained in Los Angeles. He just had left. He was with Prabhupada for a year or more and then, he, he just, for whatever reason, he stayed in L.A., so Prabhupada came to New Vrindavan and he didn't have a servant. 
So it was Kirtanananda Maharaj who, he, who um, offered me the service and gave me to Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada didn't have anything to do with it. He never asked for anything. He didn't say, I need a servant. He would go on without a servant and just whoever was around would cook that day, who was ever around that could massage, would give him massage. He didn't ask for things for himself. I'll tell that story when, you know, the monkeys ate his shoes here at, during Kartik <laughs> 1972, his slippers, and I got them back, and they had bite marks on them, ripped his heel off. And when Prabhupada, I showed him after recovering him, and Prabhupada said, oh, he said, can you glue that back on? <laughs> and I said, yes. So I glued it back on, and he kept wearing those same slippers with the monkey bite marks on, on the feet for, for the rest of the month. He never said, why don't you get me a pair of slippers? He did, did, didn't even think about it. <coughs> he, he didn't need it. He didn't care. And then finally, I mean, and I was that dull-headed that I didn't think about it either because he didn't think about it. So it, it, it wasn't a thing that I always thought, Prabhupada needs this, Prabhupada needs... Because he, he, he never needed anything. He never seemed like, you know, he, he had desires for, you know, a, a softer cushion or, you know a nicer bead bag. He had no desire. He was happy. He was happy doing his service. So weeks later, somebody said, does Prabhupada need anything? And finally, a light went off in my head. I said, oh, he could use some new walking shoes. You know? <laughs> but it was literally a month later. So he wore those little monkey bitten things yeah. you know, for a long time. So the same thing with his servant. He didn't ask. I was in the right place. We say right place at the right time. And then after 16 months, I left. And eight months later, I was back in New Vrindavan. And again, he came to New Vrindavan, and his servant had left him. So I was there again. So Brahmananda said, do you want to come and be Prabhupada's servant? It wasn't Prabhupada said, tell Sruta Kirti, you know, get back here. He didn't, he was, he was detached from, for himself. He was very detached. He said once in... Delhi, we stayed, this was the first time after being here for th three months, uh, one place after another, struggling in cold places. Here was ice cold water bathing during Kartik then, you know, in, in the dark concrete floor, all concrete walls around, everything freezing. So after a few months, we were staying at this life member's house. It was gorgeous. And uh, we all had our own rooms. I had a room, Shama Sundar, the secretary had a room, Sanskrit editor had a room, all marble floors, we all had our own bathrooms. So I was in ecstasy. <laughs> this was in India. So I went into Prabhupada's room, and he, he always, again, he, he knew, you know, he just knew. So he looked at me and he smiled, he said, so do you like it here? <laughs> and, uh, said, yes, Prabhupada, you know, I, was, I couldn't contain myself, I was, you know, they cooked all this nice food stuff, prasadam, I was eating. So he said, yes. He said, if, if Krishna gives us a bed, we sleep in a bed. He said, but if he doesn't give us a bed, we sleep on the floor. And, and that's how he did. He didn't, didn't mind. He, he, he didn't, you know, and when he was outside, in the outside world, in the plains, in the airports, and he, he, p if people made a lot of noise, he never wanted you to do something about it. You know, if people were a disturbance. He, it, it didn't matter. When he was in the temple, if he heard he was doing his translating work, there was noise that he didn't like. like in Perth, Australia, um, we were all in this one little cottage. So in the morning, they would have Mangalarti. But it was right next to Prabhupada's room. So I said, Prabhupada, is it, you know, is it all right? Because he was doing his translating work at that time. And he said, you can tell them to chant Japa. He said, it's the same. Japa and Kirtan. He said, it's all the same. Mm -hmm. So he made <coughs> a special provision because it did, it, it, it stopped him from his service. So service was the key. You know, wh if something prevents us from doing our service, then we have to figure out how to correct that. So he said, tell them to chant Japa. But all they had to be awake, but chanting Japa. That's what I did. I had no Mongol Arctic I was going to. I just sat in my room and chanted at that time. All right.
Anything else? I think we can be done. It's late.